And welcome everybody. This is Rodney Paul. We are about to start Art Viewing Adventures. I am really pleased to have Steve Sitton with, is am I saying your last name right, Steve? Perfect. Steve Sitton of the um, Thomas, ben Thomas Hart Benton uh, Historic Site. And tell us more about that, Steve. So you're located in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what happens there? And, and I know sometimes people out, you know, on the coast aren't as familiar, but we're in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, pretty common mistake. Um, Benton, and I'll get more into this when we start the program formally, but for whatever it's worth, is one of the most famous painters from Missouri, 1930s, 1940s. So Missouri State Parks actually has the house and the studio uh, here in Kansas City where he lived and worked the last half of his life. And it is actually completely furnished. So what we're gonna be doing today is kind of taking a brief tour through the house. We'll talk about specifically his murals, um, but we are open to the public. We do guided tours. Um, they're $5 per adult. They last about 45 minutes. But we really try and go for, you know, the Bentons have left for the day and you get to take a peek around. And you can go to all these art museums all over the country and see his artwork. But here, hopefully, if we do our job right, you get a better sense of his personality, his lifestyle, his family, his work habits, things like that. You get to see what books he had on his shelf. You get to see, you know, what kind of clothes he had hanging in his closet, those sorts of things. So, so Steve, I, I am playing the drive across the country probably um, at the end of the year or maybe early next year. I would love to stop by. If we go on one of these tours, do we get you as the guide or is it, um, do you have other people involved? Sometimes it's me. Um, I've been here for almost 21 years now. So I've done my fair share of tours, but uh, I do about every fourth or fifth tour. Um, but I've got a full-time historian and then a couple part-time tour guides. Um, one of the things I really like about our tour and what I've really tried to stress to our, especially when I'm training a new tour guide is we don't have a script. You know, it's, it's not like it, those can be kind of boring. You know, if you look to your left, you'll see this. It's, we have a conversation. We, you know, what are people interested in? What's catching their eye? Um, how much knowledge do they have? Some people come in, they, they have no idea who Thomas Hart Benton is. That's fine. We can start at the beginning. Some people just want to see an old house. We can do that tour. Um, some people are docents at art museums and we can do that kind of tour as well. So, yeah, I'm, I don't call, I, I am affiliated with another art museum, but we call ourselves guides and we, we have mm -hmm. the same philosophy. We love yeah. discussions. I always feel like everybody brings their own perspective to these things. So I'm hoping I get you, Steve, when I come out there. It's, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. You, you can always ask. <laughs> and, and even though, like I said, I've done tours for, well, plus my previous job for 27 years now, I still in, really enjoy it. I, I love working here. Um, I work in the Benton home. I actually also live here. My apartment's on the third floor, which is kind of cool. And I just get to absorb it absorb it all the time and um so yeah i love my job so you live there that's yes. that's really cool yeah. so I, I walk to work walk down a flight of stairs <laughs> no parking problems i hope no parking problems yeah <laughs> save on gas and then uh kansas city is also known for um like amazing steak right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep in baseball yeah. we we uh we we giants fans are familiar with um we've had some encounters with the royals and yeah yeah we, we will mention our last super bowl win maybe so. <laughs> well we are at one o'clock and i know uh nikki will get us started with community living campaign nikki why don't you tell us about the community living campaign okay good thank you rodney um hi everybody my name is nikki Transvenia, and i'm here with um another clc staff uh Jennifer is our tech person. So thanks, Jennifer, all the time. She's great. Hello, um, Nikki. Oh, yeah. Hi, Paco. <laughs> so we're the Community Living Campaign, and we're a nonprofit in San Francisco. And we um, support and advocate for seniors and people with disabilities in San Francisco. So one of the, there's several ways we do that. Uh, one of the ways is by bringing you programming and exercise online and programs such as this. Um, we get involved with issues that are, real, are really important to seniors and people with disabilities. In fact, just a few days ago, our board, CLC board took a position on the very controversial issue in San Francisco, but the JFK 
Drive in Golden Gate Park, whether it should be permanently closed or left open. And it's very controversial. And we have said that we want to see it open because you know if they close it they need to comply with a lot of conditions that will make it accessible to everybody so um that's when you say open you mean open for cars right open for cars yeah well yeah so tomorrow after going back and forth with so many different organizations the board of supervisors and the san francisco county transportation committee is actually going to vote on it tomorrow so this wow. is something you've been hearing about and care about tomorrow's the day to call up or even today, call your supervisor and let them know how you feel about it. So we get involved in things like that. And then we bring you all this great programming. We've been doing this for over two years now. And your program, Rodney, is one of the most popular. And I'm real excited about today because it's all about murals. And I just eat this stuff up. I love murals. So thank you so much for coming, Steve. I'm anxious to hear your program. I'll put a little bit of info in the chat so you can find out more about community living but I don't want to take up too much time from the program. So go with it, Rodney. Great. Thanks, Nikki. And um, we are really pleased to Hi, be here. Hi, Rodney. I'm always happy to have Paco. Paco is like one of our um, most loyal, I think the most loyal audience member. So always thrilled to have you. But this is Art Viewing Adventures. We've been, um, this will be, we've done more than 40 of these shows since the start of the pandemic. Wow. But this one is really special. We've had shows that were uh, um, Bernice, Iwamoto has uh, presented before for us, and Bernice is, has gone on many, many virtual tours around the world, and this was one of her all-time favorites, and she wanted to connect Steve Sitton with, with me. Steve is with the Thomas Hart Benton Historic Site in Kansas City, Missouri. Am I saying that right? Missouri, right, Steve? It depends. <laughs> we, we always, we, we coastal people never quite know. Um, but it, it's a really amazing place, and he is a muralist. We, we have been talking a bit on this show about murals because we have wonderful murals in San Francisco, uh, and we're going to be doing another show. Nikki and I are working on a show on the Presida Eyes muralists of, who are in the Mission District and elsewhere. Um, but Thomas Hart Benton, he's someone who was involved in this sort of thing many, many years ago and left a rich leg legacy of works behind. So, Steve, I'm going to let you take over and tell us all about Thomas Hart Benton. Okay. Well, give me one second to get my, sh my screen shared. And there. All right. So, you should see uh, Missouri State Parks logo. We do. Um, good. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and just put them in the chat um, and we'll either get to them as we go along or uh, I'll have time hopefully at the end to come back. But uh, I do work for Missouri State Parks um, at the Thomas Hart Benton Home and Studio State Historic Site. We actually are the smallest Missouri State Parks. We only have a third of an acre here, um, but it is essentially just the house and in Tom's art studio out back. We're right in the middle of the city in a in a nice, well-to-do neighborhood. Um, so let's give you a little bit of, of Thomas Hart back, Benton's background. Some of you may not be familiar with, with who he is, but I bet when we start getting into this, you probably will start recognizing the style. So this program here I've titled Thomas Hart Benton, His Life and His Murals. This is a photo of him at work uh, on his next to last mural out in his studio. He's 83 years old in this photo, so still looking pretty good. So uh, his biography, his history, uh, he is from Missouri. He's born in the small town of Neosho, Missouri. Uh, it is down on the edge of the Ozarks. It is in the extreme southwest corner of the state. So it's almost in Oklahoma, almost in Arkansas. Uh, born April 15th, 1889, so just last week he would have had his 133rd birthday. But if you're doing any research, it can get a little uh, confusing. There are two Thomas Hart Bentons. There's our guy, the painter, who you see here at three years old, and then there is his great-great-uncle, Senator Thomas Hart Benton, Missouri's first U.S. Senator and the state's longest U.S. Senator. Uh, for you folks out in California, you might be more familiar with Senator Benton uh, his son-in-law was John C. Fremont, uh, who married Jesse Benton Fremont, the senator's daughter. Uh, so he was an early explorer uh, and an early uh, 
legislator or governor, I think, out in California and, and New Mexico. So you might be familiar with, with the polit political and, and historical Bentons, but the artist is the senator's great, great nephew. And then these are the painter's parents, Colonel Messenius Eason Benton and Elizabeth Wise Benton. Uh, the colonel, he's the, you know, the Southern gentleman, Colonel Sanders, Sanders sort of colonel. Uh, he was a successful lawyer in Neosho, Missouri. He was a U.S. district attorney. And starting when Tom was seven, uh, the colonel was elected to the U.S. Rep House of Representatives. So law politics definitely was the family business. And that is what young Tommy was supposed to grow up to do. But Tommy liked to draw and doodle. Um, when he was 17, uh, he got a job in the town of Joplin, Missouri, about 15 miles away from his hometown. It's a boom town. It was a mining community. Um, and he is working on a surveying crew there, uh, making seven bucks a week, which in 1906 for a 17-year-old isn't too bad. But in Joplin, there was a pretty well-known bar called the House of Lords, and at the back of the bar was a large painting uh, of a nude woman. 17-year-old Tom's in there checking it out pretty intently. Some of the miners come in, uh, and they start really razzing him, you know, hey, you know, sonny boy, you like the naked lady picture? And Tom said, no, no, I'm studying it. I'm an artist. And he later said that was the first time he admitted to anyone that he was an artist. These miners, you know, challenged him, but they said, okay, we hear somebody is looking for an artist, prove it, go apply for the job. Benton went across the street and now is hired as the cartoonist for the Joplin American newspaper, doing drawings like this, exaggerated caricatures, big heads, little bodies, um, but he's now making 15 bucks a week. So he's a man, he's got a job. Um, he has no reason to go back and finish high school. As you can well imagine, his parents are still pretty upset about this, especially his father, who, again, you got to become a lawyer, you got to get educated. So Tom and his father work out a deal that if Tom will go back and finish high school at a military school, that'll whip him into shape. Then after that, if he still wants, he can go off and study art. So Tom is sent to the military academy in Western Illinois, right across the river from St. Louis, um, joins the football team. You see him highlighted there. But once football season ends, he completely loses interest. He gets an English teacher to write some recommendations. And his father is pretty much, okay, fine, I've had it, go study art. So Tom now is reluctantly allowed to go to the Art Institute of Chicago. He's still planning on being a cartoonist, as you can see in this self-portrait. But he said the first time he stuck his brush in a big fat glob of oil, it was time to be a serious artist. And if you're going to be a serious artist, where do you go? Paris. Tom Benton studies in France for about two and a half, three years. Um, he studies several different places at the Academy Julien and the Academy Cola Rossi. He was not actually a good student. He didn't know nearly as much as he thought he did. He's only 20 years old, uh, so his ego definitely takes a hit. He would cut class and go to the, the Louvre and sketch on his own. He is trying all different kinds of art, impressionism, pointillism, cubism. He goes out to the south of France uh, to sketch in the landscape, like you see in the background of this image. Um, so he's just really all over the board. So he absorbed a lot, he experimented a lot in France, but academically not that great. And he's also gets, you know, he's constantly writing back home, you know, like, send me a little bit more money. I'm gonna be a great artist soon. Um, so after about three years, he's, he's called back home. And then shortly after that, he heads off to New York City. Again, still planning on being a great artist. Um, as you see in this painting, he did Upper Manhattan from about 1917. Still very much a French influence there, especially in this case, Cezanne. Um, but he is doing everything he can to stay in the art game. He's teaching all over the place. He's working in galleries. Um, he is again saying, you know, I, I, I'll do anything that doesn't degrade my artistic ideals, but my outlook at present is far from bright. Um, but he, he's sure he's, he's going to make it eventually. So he actually lives uh, in New York City for about 22 years. He does have quite a bit of big city background. 
during his time in New York, as you see with this sketch of the Brooklyn Bridge, he does move to a more representational, more realistic style of art. Again, still teaching all over the place. He gets a job across the river in New Jersey painting movie sets. He begins to do a couple murals and gets thought of now as a muralist, but still in many respects thought of as a, a modern New York City artist, certainly not a Midwesterner. But I mentioned those movie studios. This, even though it is not a, a long part of Tom Benton's career, it is, I think, very crucial to his development. It's the silent movies. So he's painting sets, he's doing research, um, he is doing some sketches and portraits of some of the early stars. So he's working for Rex Ingram, who uh, is most known for doing, uh, directing Rudolph Valentino in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. He also works for uh, J. Gordon Edwards. So these big names actually in early movie studio uh, directing. So this is the, again, still kind of in the art world, uh, the creative world, certainly. So what did he learn from this experience? He learned how to paint big, big backdrops, big set designs. He had to learn how to work fast. So he starts using fast drying tempera paints. And later on, many of his murals were done in egg tempera. To show up on that early black and white film, he starts using bold colors, strong contrast. And he sees set designers making little dioramas of the scene. Um, this will certainly play into uh, his development. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Power plus publicity, you know, that's if he's gonna be a famous artist, publicity is gonna be important. And maybe most importantly, how to tell stories. Um, so all of these aspects lead to him moving from movie studio work into murals. Right at the end of this period, uh, World War I, Tom joins the Navy. He thought, thought that would be safer than, than being drafted by the Army. Never went overseas, didn't see any action. He was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, he tells the Navy, hey, I'm an artist. So they started using him as a draftsman. Whenever one of the ships came into the harbor, Tom had to do a drawing of it, especially of the camouflage patterns um, so that the Navy could identify these ships. He said he had a lot of free time, so he starts doing drawings and watercolors of the harbor installations, the other sailors, um, the ships, of course. So this, again, moves him into this realism, this representational kind of art. And it also makes him realize that, you know, I'm not really a New Yorker. I am a kid from the Ozarks. You know, here's all these other rural boys. He goes back to New York City, um, picks up his teaching job again. And one of his students is Rita Piacenza. She is born near Milan, Italy, comes to this country when she was about 12. Um, she, when they meet, is 22. Tom Benton is 28 years old. Um, they court for about four years and then get married in 1922, which is when this self-portrait is done. Notice how Tom shows himself as this big, burly, handsome guy, looks very uh, Errol Flynn or Douglas Fairbanks. Rita is kind of the Hollywood starlet there sitting down, uh, very cinematically lit sort of scene. But if you're going to paint yourself, why not? Uh, they begin to go to Martha's Vineyard for the summer. Eventually, they buy a cottage up there. They go to Martha's Vineyard almost every year. Um, for the rest of their lives. Um, she was his business manager. She was devoted to him. She raised their children. She ran the household. She thought he was the greatest artist ever. And they were married for almost 53 years. A couple years later, their son TP is born, Thomas Piacenza. Um, he uh, became a professional classical flute player, as you see here. He died 12 years ago at the age of 83. When he's a boy, uh, Rita corrected TP's manners on something, and, and TP replied, well, when I grow up, I don't want to be a gentleman. I want to be like my daddy. And then after 22 years in New York, Tom uh, decides he's ready to come back to his home state. Uh, he said, I have little faith left in the leadership of New York and am through with it. He has a couple reasons why he leaves New York and why he returns to Missouri. He has become very, very famous by now. Uh, Christmas Eve, 1934, he's on the cover of Time Magazine, the first artist to get this honor. 
Uh, another Midwestern artist, Grant Wood, the guy from Iowa that you see there in the center, did American Gothic, The Farmer, The Pitchfork. Uh, they became friends. They had done a lecture tour. And Grant Wood, who had written a pamphlet uh, titled The Revolt Against the Cities, kind of convinces Benton that, you know, the New York is dead. The big cities are dead. It's the rural parts of America. It's the middle of the country. This is going to be the future of the United States, and in particular, the future of American art. Um, so he kind of helps plant that idea in Benton's head. You can also see in this photo, too, that um, even though compared to that uh, self-portrait with Rita painting, uh, Tom Benton actually was not a very big guy. Uh, he was five, two and a half, five foot three. But he paints big. He talks big. Tom also gets a job. He is hired as the head of the painting department at the Kansas City Art Institute. Here's his contract for 1936-37. Again, you're at the end of the Depression, and Tom Benton is making $375 a month, $3,000 a year. That ain't too bad. And most importantly, he is hired to paint a huge mural for the Missouri State Capitol in Jefferson City, right in the center of the state. So he is able to come back to his home state in glory in 1935. And then a couple of years later, they purchased the house that I am now at. Uh, this is the current you know, Benton Home and Studio Historic Site. It's a home that uh, he purchased. He didn't have it built. It was about a 35-year-old house. It's a good size house, about 7,800 square feet. They're now doing well enough that Rita wrote a check for the place. And other than summers on Martha's Vineyard, they live here the rest of their lives. Just after they buy the house, their daughter, Jessie, is born. She is now 82. She spends a lot of the year up on Martha's Vineyard at that summer cottage. Here she is uh, with a painting that of, of Tom did of her uh, at four years old, I think, three or four. So we're going to take a quick tour through the house. Um, here we are out on the front sidewalk looking up at the front door that you can just kind of see uh, here behind that pillar. It's native limestone, it's cedar siding, it's a big rambling stone house. And this is what you would see. That front door is there on the right-hand side. And then as you come in through the front door, you have that great central fireplace with the stairs to the second floor round, going up and around behind. Um, as I mentioned earlier, everything in the house belong to the Bentons. Those are their couches. Those are their lamps. Uh, in the dining room in the distance, the, the dishes are still there in the cabinets. So we, again, really a good sense of what life was like for the Bentons. The dining room, uh, they did a lot of entertaining Saturday evenings. Rita would make some extra pasta, do a few steaks, get a big jug of cheap red wine. These parties uh, would be pretty lively. There would be art students here so that Rita could get a hot meal in them. There would be musicians, there would be neighbors, local politicians and bankers sometimes, businessmen. But it also was a good chance to sell some artwork. Because you see in the background, Tom's artwork was hanging all over the house. This also served as a gallery. So we're going to go upstairs. There's four bedrooms up here and a really nice library. Um, Tom was an avid reader. He could read French and Italian. A lot, of the, a lot of these books are history and reference books because he does do a lot of history-themed paintings. But then mixed in, he's got things on music, philosophy, religion, James Bond, um, economics, feminism, Reader's Digest condensed, just a little bit of everything. So here we've kind of passed through the library looking back at a couple of the bedrooms. And then this is uh, out in the backyard. So again, that big rambling stone structure. And also out back, or off to the side, I should say, is Rita's garden. We've let it kind of get taken over by the ivy, which Rita was doing towards the end of her life. Um, but she had this pretty extensively uh, planted with flowers, flowering bushes. And then in the distance, you see the outbuilding. And here we are looking up the driveway. In 1903, the big opening that served for the carriage house. The other half of the building was the stable. Then the carriage house is converted into a garage. After the Bentons buy the place in 1939, he has that stable turned into his art studio and has that great big window installed. There we are looking into the studio, and there is Tom sitting uh, about 1940 with that window. That window faces north. He doesn't want harsh sun. He doesn't want glare. 
Um, so this gives them a soft, constant, indirect light. So that's what it looked like about 1940. And that's what it looks like today. Still his tools scattered about. I love that he's got old coffee cans for his brushes. Um, he is out here working six, seven days a week, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. This really was his job. And that gives you a sense of just how prolific he was. Um, you can see him surrounded by his artwork out there. And he kind of talked about, you know, when he was teaching, you know, it's like, you don't really choose to be an artist. You can't help it. You just have to be. But he also said, it's not natural talent. It's not inspiration. It's work. Be in the studio all the time. Be studying art. Go to art museums and look at, at the old masters and how they compose paintings. So we're going to get in the murals here. Uh, before we do, did anybody have any burning questions? Was there anything that was oh, coming up? I had one, Steve. I'm just sure. you showed us that mural at the state capitol uh -huh. in Missouri. Is it yep. still there? Yep. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit in just a second. Great. That's anything it. else that's come in? Not yet. But I didn't see I, anything specifically. So but we encourage people to throw questions in the chat. Okay. Well, let's get into the murals. Um, Benton considered murals to be the highest form of art because it was public art. He did 15 murals over his career, um, and he says, they put me in an exalted state of mind. Uh, I paint with downright sensual pleasure. The colors I use make my mouth water. So, um, and I talked about how his early work in the movie studios helped get him prepared to be a muralist. Come on, there we go. So his first mural series, um, and it's actually in panels, is something that was never asked for. It was an uncommissioned piece. Collectively, it's titled American Historical Epic. Started about 1919, so right after he gets finished with uh, his term in the Navy uh, at the end of World War I. And Benton wants to paint the history of the United States from the first European settlement, as you see here with discovery, that is panel number one. And he's gonna paint all the way up until American history, 1930 or so, 1920. Um, he's not real sure. And he's going to do it like a textbook in chapters. And he's going to do, he's not positive, 12 chapters or so, six or seven panels per chapter. Um, but again, of the people's history. So he's going to do about 60 or 70 of these panels. They're large. Uh, discovery that you see here is about six feet tall, about four feet wide. Huge, huge project really too big, both in size and in scope. And again, it's something no one has asked for. So he does about 18 panels or so, and then just kind of runs out of steam. Um, so here is Palisades, um, also from chapter one. Uh, now the Europeans are setting up some, some Palisade fences, uh, actually at the request of one of the Eastern tribes to help protect them from, from a tribe they were warring with. But Benton's mural, and maybe you can already spot this, are really pretty different from the way murals had traditionally been done. Traditionally, murals were pretty flat on a wall. Benton really has a lot of depth of field. He has things going on in the background. Again, using those bold colors. Tom almost always has a sense of action in his paintings. For a long time, murals had really been thought of as, as a flat decoration on a wall that need to be subservient to the architecture of the wall of the room. And Tom doesn't see it that way. For him, the mural is just a giant, or the wall is a giant canvas. And again, instead of painting so much of the famous Americans or you know the lives of the saints or the kings or whatever, uh, he tends to paint more the people and how they did it. And most importantly, their action. Um, it's an idea Tom had had for quite a while. And in fact, at the age of 17, he talked to his mother about maybe doing something uh, similar to this. So these are the first and last chapter of, or panels of chapter two. So in the Pathfinder, you have this Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone type of figure, although it's not specifically supposed to be uh, one of those, those gentlemen. Um, now the, the colonists are moving deeper inland. They're going across the Appalachian Mountains. They're encountering new tribes. And in the last panel of this chapter, Lost Hunting Ground, now that the Americans have gotten more established on the interior, it's the Native Americans that are having to move. There are four panels in between here. 
that same stylized cloud goes all the way across with that blue mountain in the background. You can also see Tom's cubist leanings that he had, he had come from. Um, but again, it's not specific events so much. It's just the conditions under which history evolved. Because that American historical epic was too big, he then scaled it down and decided instead of painting the history of the entire United States, I'll just paint the history of New York and what the island of Manhattan looked like in four different periods. Uh, 1400 when it was uh, the Native Americans and then what it looked like in the 1650s when it was New Amsterdam, the Dutch. He hoped that these panels would be purchased by the New York Public Library. And in fact, he specifically designed them to fit in some niches there. Um, so again, it's an uncommissioned piece. Then he paints what Manhattan, New York looked like during the Civil War uh, with the Union soldiers marching off and then New York with the building boom, the skyscrapers going up in the 1920s. These are not well known. Uh, they've only been exhibited three times and not for you know 90 years. Um, I really had to search to find images of them, but it does turn out they still are in New York. They actually are in a penthouse in Manhattan and you can see two of them on the wall there. So this gets him up to about 1930. Now he does get a commission piece uh, to do a mural for the boardroom of the New School for Social Research. This painting or this mural is titled America Today. Tom had been traveling all over the country doing sketches. So he took his drawings that he had done of what America looked like in the 1920s and transformed it into this mural. Um, in 1984, the mural was purchased by AXA Equitable Life Assurance and had set up in their headquarters. They're on Broadway in a linear fashion. And then in 2012, they were donated to the Metropolitan Museum. And that is where they now are back in their original configuration to look like they are in that boardroom of the New School for Social Research. Um, Benton did not do any WPA work during the Great Depression, um, but his style and Grant Wood and, and some other associated artists really did influence these New Deal sorts of murals, um, paint local history, paint local scenes for the post office, for the high school, for the courthouse. Um, but Benton actually didn't do any specific WPA work. So. He does it in different parts of what he depicts as different parts of the country. So here is Deep South. And Tom's really showing how the different parts of America looked different and appeared different to him, at least, in the 1920s. Um, he didn't get any money for this project, but it did cover his expenses. And he did get um, a lot of attention for it. Um, there's a lot of cross influence between Thomas Hart Benton and the Mexican muralist. Uh, in fact, one of the best known, uh, Jose Orozco, was actually painting a mural in the same building at the same time. So Benton and Orozco actually knew each other. Tom also knew uh, Jose Rivera, as, or not Jose, uh, Diego Rivera, excuse me, um, as well. So a lot of cross influence there. So, And then here is the Midwest. So you've got a grain silo in the top uh, left. You've got some logging on the right-hand side some hogs and corn there in the lower left-hand side. Um, Tom is still not real experienced as a muralist, so he's not very good at separating his scenes. So that is actually just an aluminum, uh, excuse me. So, um, so he did this kind of a, a, a aluminum sort of uh, border between the scenes to kind of separate those. But what it really shows is kind of the roaring 20s, the jazz age, and he does depict the cities. So here are city activities with Subway. You've got a boxing match. You've got some, some dancers. You've got a uh, Salvation Army uh, meeting going on here. God's love. You can see the poster in the background. Here's the Subway scene as well. And this is city activities with dance hall. Um, but people complain that Benton's murals were too loud and too disturbing to be in good case in good taste. And Tom said they represent the US, which is also loud and not in good taste. But again, certainly not the famous Americans of the day. It's everyday sorts of scenes. And Tom does include himself in this mural right here uh, in the bottom right hand corner. And then the center left is his wife and new son TP. 
Then uh, also that same year, he does uh, pr- possibly, we're not, I'm not going to say convincingly this is a Benton, but it appears to be, um, he painted a mural, a small mural for uh, the headquarters of a drug store in Washington, D.C. called the History of Water or the Water Story Mural. Um, It wasn't refound until 1975 after Tom Benton died. But it does have, especially this woman right here, some of the same scenes and figures uh, that are in that City Activities uh, America Today mural. Then in 1932, he gets another commission uh, for the Whitney Museum in New York City for their library titled Arts of Life in America. He makes $1,000 for this one. 22 years later, the Whitney decides Benton's, you know, he's old fashioned. He's not this avant-garde artist anymore. So they sell the mural to the New Britain, Connecticut Museum of Art uh, for $500. Just like America today, he does it the different parts of the country and what the arts of that section of America are like like. But Tom says the arts of life are popular arts and generally undisciplined. They're more like play. So it's not so much opera and uh, the ballet. It's radio. It's jazz. It's the movies. Here is arts of the West. So it's bronco busting. It's playing poker. It's, you know, fiddle music sort of thing. Um, Arts of the South, gospel singing. Uh, There's some guys over here on the left-hand side playing craps, another religious meeting uh, going on, get next to God, it says. Um, So again, now he's got a reputation as a muralist, and along comes his biggest commission for the state of Indiana to be shown at the Chicago World's Fair. He's going to get $7,000 for this project. In 1933, that is a lot of money. Um, It turns out to be 22 panels, 12 feet tall, about 230 feet long, so almost a football field in length. And he got the whole thing done in six months. Uh, Just an incredible undertaking and output that he did there. But the World's Fair is getting ready to open. So here it is in its original installation. You can see the size of it uh, compared to the doors underneath this mural. You would walk into this room and it completely surrounds you. It got him a lot of attention. It was the, as the World's Fair Weekly newspaper said, it has been the artistic sensation of the World's Fair. Hundreds of thousands of people have seen Benton's mural. And this, again, gives you an idea of the size of it. There is Tom Benton working on two of the panels. You can see he has drawn it in ahead of time, and he has also gridded it off. So you'd start with small drawings and then grid those off and then blow them up onto the larger canvas and then fill in the blanks. After the World's Fair was over a couple years later, then those murals, those panels are taken to Indiana University. Again, you can see them unloading off of the flatbed trailers. That gives you an idea of the size of those murals. And they now hang, most of them are in the entrance hall for the Indiana University Auditorium, where you can still see them. But Benton says, history was not a scholarly study for me, but a drama. It was not a succession of events, but a continuous flow of action. And in his paintings in his mural, there is very much this flow, this rhythm. Um, that's, that's just one of his characteristics of his artwork. So here are a couple panels of them. Uh, actually quite a lot of detail for only six months worth of work. One half of the mural is the cultural progress of Indiana. The other half of it is the industrial progress of Indiana. And they kind of mirror image each other as they go around the room. So he starts with the Native Americans, the mound builders, and goes all the way up until the Indy 500, Indianapolis or Indiana basketball, uh, steel mills, airplanes, uh, things like that. But Tom wants to paint American scenes. So we've already seen he tried to paint the history of the United States. Then he painted the history of New York. Here he is painting the history of Indiana and again, the progress of it. Then in 1935, he gets a commission to paint a mural for the new 
uh, headquarters of the post office in Washington, D.C. It was going to be the history of the Postal Service. Um, so here is a drawing he did for Colonial Post. So the mail's being delivered by courier and stagecoach and horse and clipper ship. And then the other panel was going to be 1930s mail. So you've got a plane, uh, a pneumatic tube down here in the bottom foreground, sorting mail and the cubby holes on a train. But the post office kept coming to Tom and, oh, take this out, put this in, don't forget about this. Um, and Tom said the whole project was just kind of boring. So he dropped it. He never finished this mural, um, never really put paint to canvas. And he gets the job back in his home state in Jefferson City. So he comes back to uh, Missouri to paint a social history Missouri. Uh, this is his second largest mural. Now he's going to make $16,000 more money than the governor makes in a year. Um, took him about uh, a year and a half altogether to do, although he is also teaching full time. And Tom said, if I have any right to make a judgment, the Missouri mural was my best work. And I think he does have the right to make that judgment. Just like most of his other murals, it's not the famous Missourians. It's the people. In this scene of a political rally, that is his father, uh, Messenius Benton, up there on the, the podium uh, giving a speech. Um, some people were pretty upset about this mural, in particular right there in the foreground, the woman diapering a baby that you can't have, you know, uh, a baby's bare bottom in the in the state capital, where's the glory of the Civil War? And Tom said, well, we didn't have a lot of big battles in Missouri. We had lots of small skirmishes. So in the background, I did show the smoke and the destruction of the, the Civil War. And there is actually a, 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 a lynching that's going on in that one. But Tom said, if you didn't have the babies being diapered, the women taking care of the babies, they couldn't have grown up to be soldiers anyways. So again, a lot of criticism. Uh, the worst criticism probably came from the Tulsa, Oklahoma newspaper. Shame on you, Thomas Hart Benton. Shame on you. You've disgraced your art as you've disgraced your state. Uh, the last wall of the mural, and again, this covers all four walls. He shows more urban Missouri, so St. Louis and Kansas City with the breweries, the shoemaking, um, the slaughterhouses. Above the doors, he has the legends of Missouri, so in the first one, he has Huck Finn, then he has Jesse James, and above this door, he has the Ballad of Frankie and Johnny. It's an old folk song uh, some of you may be familiar with, actually based on a real event that did happen in St. Louis. So I'm going to take a little side note, um, especially since a lot of you guys are in San Francisco. And right after the Missouri Capitol mural, Tom does a pair of very large nude paintings, one called Persephone, one called Susanna and the Elders. I mentioned him doing sketches. So those are drawings uh, of those for those two women. And there are the paintings, both done 1938, 39. Persephone based on a Greek myth, Susanna and the Elders, a biblical story. Um, as you can see, both quite nude. Um, if Tom had painted them in that classic tradition, it wouldn't have been a problem. These are Ozark farm girls laying there naked with an old man leering at them. Um, Persephone is now here in, still in Kansas City at the Nelson Art Gallery, Nelson Atkins Art Museum. Suzanne and the Elders as, is at the DeYoung Art Museum there in San Francisco. Um, Susanna actually was supposed to originally go to the St. Louis Art Museum for an exhibition, and they turned her down. They said, we don't want her. Um, there's too much controversy over her. Um, here is Tom in his studio at the Kansas City Art Institute uh, with the model for Susanna um, and some of the reaction to them. Uh, a critic of the day said it's unsurpassed by anything thus far produced in America. A pastor from St. Louis who was opposed to the Susanna coming there said she is lewd, immoral, obscene, lascivious, degrading, and insult to womanhood. Uh, a recent biographer, I love this quote, uh, that says Persephone is one of the great works of American pornography. Tom Benton said about the model for Persephone that she was a beautiful girl. She was so beautiful that you go away muttering the rest of the day. So um, I don't know if Susanna is on exhibit right now at the De Young. She probably is. Um, she's kind of such a signature painting of Ben's that I, I hope she is. But you come around the corner there in the Nelson to see Persephone and you can't miss her. She's big and naked and glorious. But because of some of the uproar over this Missouri Capitol mural and these two nude paintings, Tom then doesn't do another mural for about 11 years. 
until 1947, he does a mural for a local department store, a women's fashionable store here in downtown Kansas City. The owner of the store was well aware of this controversy uh, that Tom had gone through. And he said, Tom, I'm not going to interfere with what you paid for my store, but for God's sake, let me stay in business. This is titled Oculus and Hercules, also based, based on a Greek myth. This mural is uh, kind of odd dimensions, 22 feet long, five feet tall, another $15,000 in 1947, pretty good. Hartsfeld store closed in 1984, and this mural is now in the Smithsonian. Then in the 50s, he's really starting to crack them out. Uh, he does, uh, I think, three murals just right in a row. This small one uh, for a historic Black university in Jefferson City, uh, Lincoln University, of Abraham Lincoln. Not my favorite Benton painting, very paternalistic view of Abe Lincoln. Um, but Benton does do an interesting thing here. He's going to make $12,000 for this mural, small mural, eight foot by six foot. Lincoln University is having trouble coming up with fee in the mid-1950s. So they had only raised about half the money. And Benton told them, you know what? Take that $6,000 you've, you've raised. I will do this mural for free. You set up an art scholarship with the money you were going to pay me. So that's, that's what he did. Uh, then in 1956, he does another small mural for a private club, uh, the Kansas City River Club here in Kansas City. Um, this one uh, shows kind of the development of Kansas City. Uh, if you're not familiar with the geography, Kansas City is on a high bluff, or the, the original location, uh, the, the downtown, I guess you would say, um, is on a high bluff overlooking the junction of the Kansas and the Missouri Rivers. It's right where the Missouri River uh, turns north if you're going backwards, but you know, you would be coming from St. Louis going upstream, you know, the Lewis and Clark days, think of that. It's right where the Missouri River turns north to head to the Dakotas and, and up towards Montana. So it's a really natural spot for a city. And that's what Tom depicts in the background, the formation of, of old Kansas City. But he said, I do prefer a square, almost square canvas. This one's more rectangular, but he does like these challenges in working in a mural, big projects, composing them all, figuring them all out, how to tell a story that makes sense, that in many cases covers uh, a time period as well. Then in 1956-57, he does a mural for the New York State Power Authority, uh, two panels with a map in between. On the right, you have the French explorer uh, up along the St. Lawrence River, Jacques Cartier, encountering the Seneca Indians. And on the left-hand side, it is the what he imagines the Seneca, their reaction to discovering the French. Um, again, really wants to get his facts right, uh, goes to Oklahoma to meet some of the Seneca uh, tribes people to sketch their facial features. He gets a hold of a copy of Cartier's journal and reads that in the original 16th century French. Um, really, really does his, his due diligence on this. And that mural is now at the New York State Museum in Albany. And then some of you may be familiar with this mural, uh, seen images of it, done for the Harry Truman Presidential Library. It's about 30 minutes away. Uh, it's a suburb of Kansas City, Independence, uh, Harry Truman's uh, hometown. Uh, this mural took Tom two and a half, almost three years. He's now 71 years old, climbing up and down. It's 500 square feet, $60,000 um, when he does this. And at this point, a brand new nice Cadillac is about 3,000. So, um, but him and Truman became pretty good friends. Truman said Tom was the best damn painter in America. So here he is up on the scaffolding working on it. But he's, he plans it all out ahead of time. I, I referred to this when he's talking about the, the, when I was talking about the Indiana mural, doing all the preliminary sketches and drawing it out and then gridding it off and blowing it up. He says, you can't change your mind up on the scaffolding without the risk of everything going awry. So he really is more of the technical, technical artist, the draftsman. So then the New York State Power Authority calls him again, and he does a mural of the uh, Jesuit missionary and explorer, Father Hennepin, the first white man to uh, see Niagara Falls. So on the right-hand side is the French coming in. On the left-hand side is the uh, Iroquois coming in. Uh, and 
this is definitely not the way you would probably expect to see Niagara Falls pictured. You would really expect it to see a vertical sort of view, but Tom does it horizontal. That just kind of has to fit the space that he's, he's working in. But again, you can see there uh, in the observation building. So he's, he's now saying, I'm not doing any more murals after the Truman Library. Uh, no more murals, they take too long, they're too big. Then the town of Joplin calls him and says, you know, you started out your art career here as a cartoonist. Would you mind doing a mural for our centennial? A small mural, five foot by 14 foot, will give you $16,000. And Tom decides, okay, I'll do that. But do you mind if I include the House of Lords where I saw that early nude painting um, when I was 17? And shall I include myself as an old man or as a young cartoonist, which... Uh, they agreed to and he, he put in, but it does show, especially on the right hand side, the the early mining industry of Joplin, Missouri. It was all lead and zinc mines down there. One of the other things he often would do in preparation for a painting or a mural, he would make a small model, a three dimensional model out of wax or clay called a maquette. And these maquettes help him with shadowing, proportion, perspective allows him to get his hands inside the painting, see it from all sides. Very few painters do this, sculptors certainly do, and it does create a sculptural depth of field to Tom Benton's artwork. The maquette you see here, uh, this one's about maybe 10 inches across, six inches deep, um, six or seven inches tall. Um, but again, you can really see that depth of field. Even though it's crude, it does allow him to work with the shadowing and, and that those perspectives. But he said, I only did this mural because it was a home country one and I could paint some of my youthful experiences. So this was his last mural, except in 1974, the brand new Country Music Hall of Fame said, hey, can you do a small mural for us on the origins of country music? Not the country music stars, but where country music came from. And Tom really enjoyed bluegrass, folk, country music. Also, he liked opera, classical music as well. So he agreed to do a mural for them. Uh, it's about six foot by 10 foot. January 19, 1975, he told Rita he was going to go out to the studio, put his signature on the mural, the last coat of varnish, and sit back and enjoy it. He had a massive heart attack, dropped dead. At 85 years old, maybe not the worst thing in the world. That mural is in Nashville at the Hall of Fame. Uh, his wife, Rita, only lived another 11 weeks. She said Tom wasn't supposed to have died. She said she had nothing left to do. She said the house was empty without him. Um, but at Tom's funeral, she did say, we need to preserve this place. We need to make a memorial of some sort. So shortly thereafter, Missouri State Parks bought the home and studio. So, so he did have a nice long life, nice long career. Here is one of his later self-portraits when he's about 81 years old. Got a little bit of a pot belly, um, but a nice, interesting, wrinkled face. Um, a lot of character there. And uh, he was also, also an excellent writer. He wrote two autobiographies. And I'm going to finish with the final line from his first autobiography. The only way an artist can personally fail is to quit work. So there he is walking up the, the driveway towards his garage and studio. So I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, we've got a little bit of time for some questions. So let me stop sharing. We, we do have a bunch of questions, Stephen. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. That, that is a wonderful background. Really gets me excited for, for coming out there to see some of these things in person. Um, first question we have, um, you know, our organization serves um, people, elderly people and people with disabilities. And so the question is, is the Thomas Hart Benton historic site um, ex wheelchair accessible? Excellent. Um, so partially, um, you can, we can get, fit a, a small van up the driveway and you can park on grade there. It is a cobblestone surface, not the best for wheelchairs, but you are on grade. We do have a portable ramp into the studio. We have a ramp into the first floor of the house. As for the second floor of the house, it is, um, it's not accessible. Um, it stairs up there. But what we have done is we have a book that has photographs of all the rooms up there and descriptions. And we're working on, hopefully, we're going to be able to do a virtual tour where you can go online and from anywhere in the world, just click on the map and walk through the house, you know, go through the house room by room at your own pace. So we're hoping that will uh, provide 
some more accessibility as well. So. Thanks, Steve. And I did post there's um, um, your website has some information on that. I put that in the yeah. chat. Um, another question. Did Benton have any individual artists um, at, who acknowledged him as an inspiration? His work certainly has a political influence. So so comment on both of those things. The other artists um, who either inspired him or he inspired in, in kind of like the po political aspects of his work. Okay. okay. Uh, a couple of the artists that Tom really was inspired by. Um, again, he was classically trained, so all the through our history, he knew a lot about them. Um, a couple of his favorites, uh, Pizarro, he liked. Uh, he liked Cezanne quite a bit. Um, the sculptures of Michelangelo, I mean, you might as well start at the top. Um, but probably the single artist from centuries before that had the biggest influence on Benton was the Spanish painter El Greco. These elongated, twisting, tortured, sometimes almost forms. You can see it in, in my background there, those, those twisting sorts of trees. Benton has been referred to as a 20th century mannerist painter. Um, as for artists he influenced, he did teach quite a bit. Um, I don't wanna get into this a lot. It's a whole big other topic. Benton's most famous student uh, far and away was Jackson Pollock and early Pollock pieces actually look similar to Benton's stuff. Um, and there definitely is an evolution there. Many of Benton's other students, while not well known, did go on to su successful careers or working careers as artists. Many of them do look very, very similar to Tom's artwork because of the way he teaches this composition and this technique. So politically, um, he comes from a political background. It's populism. So Senator Benton, um, kind of the Andrew Jackson, Jacksonian democracy. So working class, rural sorts of folks. That is what Benton often painted and what he saw. Um, he sees social history quite a bit. Um, the action, the conflict uh, between people, the economic sorts of systems. He flirted with Marxism when he was living in Greenwich Village in the 1920s, who didn't. Um, he later broke with them because they really wanted you to use the artwork to pre preach the message, show the oppression of the working classes. And Tom doesn't so much show them as oppressed, he shows them working hard, um, but being, if not successful, at least making a living. Um, and Tom eventually really kind of becomes a New Deal Democrat. What about, um, you know, he had that mural of the Deep South. Do, do, do we have any sense of his feelings on uh, the racial um, Actually, questions? In Maybe uh, later on we can do another one of my presentations, Art, Race, and Thomas Hart Benton, where I really get into that. Um, short answer, that. <laughs> he does include African-Americans a lot in his paintings. And what he's painting is American life, American labor, American culture. He sees the African-Americans as part of that. Um, so he doesn't just paint white people. He does include African-Americans quite a bit. His daughter, Jessie, talks a lot about his incredible sense of justice and fairness. Tom was a member of the NAACP and the uh, ACLU. Great. And, and by the way, we would love to take you up on that, Steve. Okay. This has been great. It's a challenging uh, program, but it's 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 one of my brand new ones. I, I, I'm really proud of it. I, I think our group would would be would be great with it. Um, you mentioned the use of eggs in. Um, I, I think that was probably tempura. But talk egg, about egg tempura. talk about the purpose of that. And I think you mentioned that you had a, a, a ten dollars and ten cents spent on eggs. Thirty five dozen eggs, something like yep. that. Yeah, when he was working on the state capitol, because he did get paid sixteen thousand dollars for that. People were upset that you know you're it's the depression. You're paying sixteen thousand dollars, you know, for this artist. Um, and, you know, there was a specific accusation that he had really overcharged them for the eggs to make the egg temper paint. And he presented him like, here's my bill for $10.50. So, yeah. Um, egg temper is a medium that the Renaissance artists had used. Um, and then it kind of disappeared. It was replaced by oils. But Benton figured if it was good enough for the Renaissance painters, it's good enough for me. So it's a, a medium he really liked. Many of his murals are done in te tempera, but he also did oils a lot. He did some watercolors. Later on, he gets into acrylics as well. So he wasn't limited to one medium, but he really liked the color and the durability of the egg tempera. Thanks. Um, we had a comment um, from uh, Vivian Holly, who is a docent with the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. She says that Susanna and the Elders is on display um, on the first floor in their newly installed modern and contemporary art 
uh, exhibition. So that's really great news. I, I, I've seen it there before, but I, I definitely, after seeing this, want to go back and see it again. I have not seen her in person. So, so come, come on out, Steve. We'd love to have you. I'd like to. <laughs> Uh, did Benton have assistance to help paint the murals? Not too much. He did most of it himself. Uh, usually he would, or if he did have assistance, it was more the transferring of the drawings. But he would do a grid system, you know, on the small piece and then just blow it up. So that's a very technical, mechanical sort of thing. Not that that doesn't take some talent, but he did most of the design, uh, the mock-up and the actual painting by himself. When he was starting on the Truman Library mural, uh, Harry Truman did come into the lobby and kind of, oh, that looks easy. And so Benton got Truman up on the, the scaffolding. And there is actually video of Truman painting in a little bit of the blue sky. But then he was like, OK, I'm paying you to do this. You know, you, you finish the rest of it. So. Very, very hardworking guy, clearly. Yep. Um, so we had a question about the maquettes. And um, by the way, Bernice uh, Iwamoto is here and she um, she was the one who recommended that you join our program. So thank you, Bernice. And she's, she mentioned the maggots being something that really blew her away when she first saw this presentation. Um, but there was a question, are they, are they, can you see some of them on display somewhere? So they weren't built to last. Usually when Tom was finished with the project, he would melt them down and reuse the wax for the next project. There are 10, maybe 12 total that survive. We have six of them still in Tom's studio. Um, there's the one that's in the Joplin City Hall for that mural. I know the Milwaukee Art Museum has one. Uh, and there's a couple others that are around, but not too many. No, no. They just weren't, they were just part of the process to him. But on six occasions, Tom did produce a bronze sculpture off of those maquettes. So there are a couple sculptures out there as well. He's not known for doing sculpture, but it is a natural outgrowth of, of making the mechanics. So he's kind of multi-talented that oh, yeah. he, can, oh, yeah. he can do that also. Mm -hmm. uh, question about the egg tempura. What is the longevity of egg tempura paint? Well, again, if Michelangelo used it, it's pretty good. Uh, it's very durable, actually. It holds its color amazingly well. You go to the state capitol, that mural still just pops. Think of dried egg on a plate. Um, it can sometimes flake a little bit, but if, if it's mixed right, it's not too bad. Um, it does dry really fast though. So you gotta work quick. You gotta be ready. Um, oil paints, you know, they're different chemically in the way they react. Oil paints actually don't really dry, but they harden. And sometimes as oils harden, they will shrink a little bit and you get, it's called alligator in these little series of square cracks in them. Um, but oils, you can mix, you know, you paint a layer on and then you can paint another layer and the, the two layers will mix and blend a little bit. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. Egg temper doesn't. Um, oils, you can really kind of glob onto a canvas. You can have waves or clouds coming off of the canvas, but uh, egg temper is a very thin, flat film. Well, and then something you and I talked about when we were planning this show, you, you mentioned this is one of 51 artists' homes that one can visit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious, like, uh, tell, me, do you, tell me, have you been to some of the others? And, and what are some of your Just favorite? a couple. Just a couple. It's a group uh, called Historic Artist Homes and Studios. It's uh, run through the National Trust. Um, so, yeah, if you go to the there you go, uh, artisthomes.org. Uh, 55 of them. I know there's four out in California, a lot of them back east, of course, because that's where a lot of the artists were. Um, some names you'll recognize, certainly some names you may never have heard of, some more modern or contemporary artists um, and some of the, the big names, too, in American art. So. We, we have one in San Francisco, the David Ireland House, mm -hmm. which is on Cap Street in the Mission District. So again, Steve, it's another reason why we, we hope you'll come out here sometime and uh, maybe we can show you around. Um, but but it, this is very cool. I didn't. I never thought about that. It, it would be a great thing to build like a cross country road trip around. And um, I, it sounds like the Thomas Hart Benton uh, estate would be would be like one of the real highlights. Beautiful it's, looking house. It's kind of a hidden gem in a lot of ways. We don't get as many visitors as I like. Um, but a lot of our tours are two, three, four people, so we can really take our time. And really, what are you guys interested in? What do you? you know, want to learn about what do you, what do you know about already and tailor a tour, hopefully for, for the visitor. Um, we're right in the middle of the country. So 
stop off, um, get some good barbecue. You know, <laughs> uh, we've got some great art museums here as well. Uh, some great culture. Uh, the new uh, Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts is just a gem architecturally and, and for opera and, and ballet and symphony. So, yep, it's people are usually pleasantly surprised by Kansas City. I, I love it here. I've, I've lived here my whole life. It's, it's a wonderful city. So. What do they say? They say um, more boulevards than Paris, more fountains than Rome. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Yep. And we, we had a delightful time when we were out there. And like I told you, I, I'm hoping to come through there again. Um, question specific to me about the, we do, we, I don't think we have our programs for May and June posted yet, but we are going to be doing um, in two weeks, one on the um, Oxman Architects exhibition at SF MoMA. Uh, and and that, so we're going to have a panel discussion of that. So we have, we have more good stuff coming up. But Steve, this has been a real treat. I just really want to thank you. Please, everyone, let's give Steve a big round of applause for. Um... I'm just going to oh yeah, Steve. Paco, tell us more. We always want to know what Paco. We always want to get the Paco report on. Like, what did you think of this program? You know, those are music like a dining room. Apparently, it is so much modern too, like in Manhattan. It's very, it is very. That's a great observation, very Paco. Expensive too. It's very modern. It's also very American. Uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, I, I've seen the kitchen too. Say that again, Paco. The kitchen also in Manhattan too. Looks like it's so, too much modern too. <laughs> well, yeah. So lots of good Thank stuff all you. over the country. Vivian is pointing out that your your art museum in Kansas City is is is, um, you know, there's a lot of great oh, yeah. art museums in the Midwest and. Um, we've been here, you know, Bernice, again, I want to just call out Bernice um, Iwamoto, who, who recommended you. She's been attending all these virtual programs from museums around the country, and we've learned a lot from, from that, and it's given me a lot of ideas for places to visit. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thanks for letting me connect with, with you guys. Um, I enjoyed it as well. So um, if you want to have me back, just Ronnie, just let me know. And... We, 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 that's a de definite yes. So you and I will talk <laughs> offline. We'll, we'll get something scheduled for later in the year. Uh, I, we have all these great comments in chat. It, people clearly enjoyed this presentation. So, Steve, thank you very much. And um, good luck to the Thomas Hart Benton uh, historic site and the, the great work you do. Uh, quick question, Rodney. Uh, what did we get up to in per participants? I count we, this as attendance. I think the high point was 35. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. Bravo. So, so this is this is like that's a that's a great attendance for us. People were clearly. I think our, our audience really loves murals, right? Yeah. yeah. And we're going to be talking more about murals. Nikki and I have this plan to do the Presida Eyes muralists, yeah. and there's some other great muralists that we could cover in the Bay Area.